And as I sat down looking at my course and seeing how can I fit this into the scheduled time and the calendar, um, it became immediately clear that I had to totally deconstruct that course. Um, and that in itself, that exercise in itself was very useful for not just that course, but all my other courses. And I also teach this course face to face. So totally taking it apart, reevaluating the important parts, and then putting together learning objectives. This is something uh, as a face in a face to face course I hadn't sort of done in my head uh, because face to face courses uh, are are much more organic that way. Um, you you know what you want to cover. You have your notes. Uh, you have a plan, uh, and you go with it and you see how much you get done. But with an online course or a hybrid course, you have to be pretty rigid with your your scheduling. And these learning objectives set up a plan. It's like writing writing a, uh, a paper or or a report. Um, you set up the introduction. This is what this is what we want to get to. Then you set up. Uh, your hypotheses, and, and then the methods and how you're going to address those hypotheses. Okay, here you set up your learning objectives. Then you say these are the things that we're going to that I'm going to have you do to reach those learning objectives. And here are the assessments that will tell me and you whether or not you reach those learning objectives. Uh, and this again has has gone over into all my other classes, my face-to-face -face classes, and made them much stronger because. Uh, Faculty often, especially you know, old war horses like me, will not take the time to sit down and really look closely at a course that they've been teaching many years. I got this in the bag. Uh, I don't have to worry about it. I got other things I have to do. Uh, why should I bother? Well, I'm here to say, do it. Um, it take take some time and do it because you will surprise yourself uh, as to oh boy, that's old or that's really clunky or there's a much better way of doing that now than, it, than there was 10 years ago. Um, the way that you teach may have changed. The technology certainly has changed. And so you're able to deliver your courses, uh, not just online, but in face-to-face -face much better by doing that process. Um, having those learning objectives really sets the tone for the entire rest of that module, and indeed the scaffold that you're building for the entire course. Because you always, in the later modules, you always want to come back to the earlier ones and say, remember when we talked about this? Remember when we talked about that? And that's the scaffolding that, that, uh, that the learning objectives build. And then you just hang everything else on that. I've been coughing up storm today. I apologize. Yeah, that's this stuff in the air, but it's supposed to get colder. <coughs> Hopefully it'll all die out. Or we will first. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about um, consistent course structure and how your um, instructional designer helped you build that consistent structure? Can I? Yes, Would I you? can. Yes, I can. <laughs> Please do. Okay. I'd be glad to. Uh, okay. Uh, consistent design in uh, a course is very important for the students and for you. First of all, it makes it easier for you to set up your modules because once you get a certain look and plan to that module, you just use that same one so you don't have to redo it all, every time. You just put different things in in the different slots. Students really appreciate that because they know where to go to look for things in every module. Um, it's just like uh, in my face-to-face -face courses. All my exams, my quizzes, and that sort of thing, they all look the same. Okay? That way there's no surprises about uh, you know, different formats and things like that. If you maintain that format, that's very important. Now, my instructional designer uh, was the one that helped me put together uh, a plan in the very first place to say, uh, she said, there's, a, there's lots of different ways to set up a module. Uh, these are some of the standard ways. Uh, some work better for different disciplines. Okay? In the sciences, what I teach, uh, it's a little more, perhaps a little more uh, cut and dried, not so much free-flowing as you do in some of your humanities courses or, or your language courses. But at the same time, you still want to have that, that structure 
that uh, students know, all right, here is the learning objectives, uh, here is things to pay attention to, here are the reminders <laughs> from that's going to be coming up, coming up last time, and then here's the course material, and then question set, quiz, model answers, and, uh, and then new stuff like a journal or a DNR or something like that, discussion and reflection, something like that. And the, the instructional designer was really important into showing me these different options that I have. Uh, supplied me with a grid to line up for each week. Um, these are, this is what's going to be covered each week, and this is how you're going to cover it. Um, it again, planning in these in online courses is everything. Um, uh, I've said it before, you don't want to be building the airplane while you're flying it, because uh, usually you end up in a death spiral. <laughs> and that's no fun for anybody. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, you've got you've got what everybody. I had it last month. A uh, guy in the office next to me's got it now. I swear it's your belly. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so when you you said that um, your instructional designer helped you create the plan and said, G gave, gave me options. Gave you options. And then and then after I did it, after I put together my first shot, my prototype, so to speak showed it to her and she said, this is nice but you missed this, or this is not very clear. You know, it might have been clear to me, but, you know, that's me. And uh, you want someone else to look at it with a different set of eyes and say, um, this could be a little clearer, this is good, this is good, this is, you've missed this. Or you could switch things around and make the flow a little bit better. So, uh, and the other thing you have to be when you're putting together a course is flexible. And you have to know how to take uh, criti uh, constructive criticism. <laughs> uh, you can't. If you're a prima donna, then you know. Then you're going to get um, uh, disappointed and angry, and, uh, and and then nobody's happy. And then you, know, you end up storming out of the room and, and saying bad things and writing your dean and things like that. <laughs> no, we don't want that. Uh, uh, just to c come back to that, sorry, <laughs> I got it on a drift. Um, uh, yeah, be flexible and uh, look around at what your colleagues are doing. Because even though you may be in one discipline, you can borrow from others. I mean, why not? I mean, this is the old why reinvent the wheel. And uh, learning how to do that. And there's a, now there's more and more great books out there. Um, that some of them are more theoretical, but some of them are how-tos. And those I have found to be very useful, too, in, in tweaking some of the things in my courses. So when you were putting together your grid, who decided what to teach and how to teach it? Me. Um, <laughs> Tell me about that. Yeah. Uh, again, the, the content for the course... Uh, I, I had I had planned out for uh, for years. I knew how the course flowed during a semester. The grid allowed me to see how to partition that material, the partitioning, and again that that required the deconstruction, in order to to see what's going to go in where and how much time I could give to each one or each each thing. And also it makes you decide what's important and what's not. And in the sciences, the, it's the old forest versus, you know, can't see the forest for the trees. Too often in the sciences, uh, especially, I find this in younger faculty, I did it myself. You, you get out, you know, from your, from your PhD or your postdoc and you're going to be teaching and you want to tell all those students all these great things that you've learned, but, uh, but you, they are not ready for it yet. They've got to know the big picture first. So over the years, I've been basically debreeding my courses and tossing out a lot of these details that they get lost in um, that really aren't that important. Um, uh, I, I just want them to, to be able to back up and see the big picture and then have one or two facts and, and examples in there that illustrate that rather than flood them with a bunch of factoids. Um, the factoids will come later. If they're really interested in it, um, they'll, they'll get that in their upper-level classes or they'll get it in grad school or they can read it on their own. 
And that's another thing. A good online course will give the students that want the factoids the ability to find those. And this is the enrichment that you can get with an online course. And this is how my online courses have enriched my face-to-face -face courses. Because in doing the research and figuring out all these extra things that they can go and see if they want to, I'm not necessarily going to test them on them or anything. They can go and find it if they want to. Um, I use that same stuff in my face-to-face -face and say, look, you want more stuff? There it is. Uh, and the good students or the interested students will. And that they can then, that will enrich their learning. But at the same time, the other students who are there just for the grade, uh, they can, they, they'll get enough to be able to, to you know, do well on the, on the assessments and, and then move on. But, uh, but that's, uh, that's my, one of my phrases is uh, uh, leading them out of the forest by getting rid of the trees. <laughs> Tell me a little bit how you use uh, module responses to give students a clear target. Okay, you mean how do I use modules basically in a target in terms of, or modular responses? I don't know what you mean by modular responses. I mean not just modules. No. Um, so like when your students give you something, um, turn in something, mm -hmm. and ask uh, questions. Right. Um, how do you use your responses to them to help direct them to where they need to go? Oh, okay. Um, that de uh, how do I use uh, my feedback to help bring them out of the weeds <laughs> and into uh, back on the path, so to speak? Uh, well, there's a number of ways of doing that. Um, a lot of times email works. And they'll, they'll email me and they'll say, help. <laughs> Or I don't get it, or that sort of thing, and that that but that helps that one student. Um, many times I find, especially in assignments, if I'm getting the, the if I'm finding students are getting off the path the same place, and a lot of them are doing that, then that's my fault because I haven't given them the trail signs that they need to stay on the path. Uh, but uh, generally, the LMS that you're using, the learning management system, is important too. Um, the one we use is Canvas. Uh, that has uh, multiple places to provide comments to the students. You can con for like in a quiz, you can comment to the student on that particular question that they answered, uh, or you can make a comment on the entire quiz. Um, that's that's one way. And in discussions and reflections, you have many places where you can comment. But those, those comments are, even if you just say a few things, will help to give the student an idea they're on, they're on the right track or I wish you had been a little more uh, descriptive. I wish you had, had developed that idea a little bit more. Um, you forgot one of the points I asked you to talk about. <laughs> Please pay attention to that in the future. Uh, or just, just great job. Uh, it's, it's amazing how much just saying great job to a student that, did a good job, will we'll really encourage them and help them to strive even more next time. Uh, but the, uh, the, you always want to be upbeat. Um, uh, it, being critical in, with a smile <laughs> is an important thing because, you, if, you know, browbeating a student never gets you anywhere, <laughs> uh, as is true in life. Uh, you, you don't make friends that way. <laughs> Unless you're messing with Janet, then you can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell me about um, how you use practice activities in your courses and ah. why you use them? All right. Uh, this is sort of like formative versus summative. Yes. yes. Um, again, this, this, those two terms are kind of like transformative learning is education ease. <laughs> You know, these, these terms. Formative simply means that you are using exercises to give them practice and then feedback and, and drill them and things. Uh, and you're not really, maybe you'll give them a little bit of credit for it because they need that carrot. <laughs> uh, but th that's, that's not the main assessment that you're going to be using. Uh, that's formative. Summative is like a quiz for a grade or a paper for a grade or an exam for a grade. Those are summative. And that's where the rubber meets the road as far as they're concerned. Um, the formative ones, uh, for example, uh, I'll give what I, in my Pathophys course, I'll give short, what I call short quizzes that 
are directly linked to the question set that they just completed. And I let them do it three times, okay? In other words, and then I average the scores for them, and then they get that's their, that's their score. Usually I find I'm looking in, by the time they get to that third time, they're nailing it. Uh, and I don't give them the answer, of course. You don't give them the answer. It's the first two times that you do give them the answers at the end. So now they can go back and see, oh, I missed that. But the first time they do it, they see the ones they missed. That makes them go back and look again and try to figure out what they did wrong. And that's the drilling. And uh, they, they, I think they really like that. Um, then, uh, then after that, then I release the model answers for the question set. So they can't see anything like that until they get to the very end of the module and have completed all, all of those assessments. Then I do the, the summative ones, which is uh, every three, four weeks I get an exam um, that is a, you know, a real exam that they only get one shot at. They don't see the answers until after the due date. Um, and that, for a lot of uh, science students, that's kind of the, the standard operating procedure, and they, they get it. Uh, they understand how, how that works, but they do like the quizzes um, because they're not too long. They're 20 points, maybe 12, 13 questions, depending on the point values for them. Uh, and the question sets, again, are, are they're worth a little bit, um, but not a lot. Uh, and that way I can look and see if they're, if they're getting it. Or if a student, in fact, I've had students that didn't get through all three of their, their tries by the time the, the, the due date come up, so it was closed. And they come back and say, could you please open that up for me? I want to finish my last shot <laughs> to, to, uh, to learn more about that. Um, also, I kind of look at the uh, journals uh, a little bit as a, as a formative, although I do get them grades, and that's an important part of their grade. Uh, the way it works is it can, it can hurt them more than it can help them. And I know that sounds funny. If they don't do them, it's going to hurt them. But if they do do them, they, and they do it uh, within the parameters, of the, they usually get most of the points. But that gives me a chance to get more feedback to them and also to see how they're progressing. Another thing about journals that I find has been very uh, interesting. At the last journal that I give, I'll give three to four journals in a semester. The last journal I have them go back and look at all of their previous journals and see if their outlook on the subject matter or their way of thinking has changed. And that, again, that's part of that transformative learning. That makes them go back and reflect again. Um, in fact, one time, and this is, this is again, a pathophys student, a nursing student, uh, he said that at the end of the course, he started keeping his own journal because he found that allowed him to, to put what he does at work and what he does at home in more of a center so he could draw from what he knows at home to work to use at work and what he does at work to use at home to, to sort of try to... Uh, merge these together better. Um, so you never know what's going to happen with these things. Plus, it's, it's pretty amazing some of the things that they'll, they'll come up with. It. Um, one of them I ask about uh, their own health, um, what they do to keep themselves healthy and set an example for their patients. And boy, I get confessions. <laughs> People saying, I really should quit smoking, or I don't exercise enough, or I could eat better, or thing, you know. And that's not bad either to make them think about that. Yeah. Too much, too much detail. Oh, I was gonna watch our time. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're over on time. Oh. Was there anything that I didn't hit that you wanted to bring up today? Make sure we got as far as. Well, the I, I talked about journals and discussion and reflections. That. What was the first question you asked? That was the journals and discussion and reflections. It was. Yeah. That was the very first question. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I have two cameras rolling. I didn't have the audio rolling for the first question. Okay. I would say we redo that if possible. Oh. Okay. It's totally my fault. I apologize. Do you know if Andy's on a tight schedule? Is he next door? Maybe he's next door. I don't know how tight. Hmm. Okay. Answer it. That was a good Quickly. question. Yeah. I, I could. I could get to it. Um. Okay. What did I say with about journals? Uh. About yeah. how you've been. Oh. So you missed all that. You missed all that stuff about transformative learning. 
was like two and a half minutes. It wasn't. Okay. Well. All right. Well, I can just say it again. You can just I you can edit whatever you want. Okay. Um, journals and discussion reflections. A journal is uh, the sort of thing where you you give them a prompt that takes them outside of the subject matter, but also incorporates some of the subject matter, possibly what you're doing at the time in the course, and have them uh, reflect upon those things and give you some uh, some responses to specific points that you make in the prompt. You have to have specific prompts and tell them what you want, or else you're going to get you know things uh, all over the ballpark that way. Um, that and discussion is reflections where I have them uh, answer the prompt, uh, and then their classmates respond to them. Okay, and then they have to respond to their classmates, and that's within. That's the, using the content within themselves. Then their personal reflection, they do a personal reflection that only I see. And that way they can say anything they want. You know, The personal reflection usually incorporates some of their thoughts about the prompt that was given, but also that is uh, also incorporates things that they have seen in what their fellow classmates have said. And they say, well, I, I still think the same way or my way of thinking has changed or all my my classmates you know they don't know what they're doing uh, because this is the way it really is and they can say anything they want <laughs> in their personal reflections and some of them do uh, but the, that's okay because they know it's safe it's a safe place for them to tell me about this and that transformative learning requires this reflection and so there's two places I have them do this reflection uh, that helps them to to take bits of knowledge and put them together in one body of knowledge, which is, of course, is transformative learning. Good. In fact, I think that was that was shorter and sweeter than the first one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you very much.